Hello everybody, today we are going to be going over scouting, how it works, what the different kites of scouts do, how much money you put in your scouting budget, who to hire as your scouting director, just about anything and everything, and then I'm going to do a brief analysis of the different types of scouts and how they'll affect your general gameplay. Anyways, we're going to be starting today by looking at the free agency pool for scouts, and I'll be discussing some of the basics of scouting. So the first thing you want to note about your scouts is that there are four categories of scouting. You have your scout majors, scout minors, scout international, and scout amateurs. So the least important here is actually going to be your scout majors, and obviously it's very critical to know who your major league players are and how they're doing. But even a poor scout with a very minimal budget is generally going to scout the major leagues accurately because major league players are fairly well established and it's very uncommon for scouts to be more than a point or so off on their accuracy of major leaguers. Occasionally, you'll have scouts who really struggle and that's obviously a major problem, but for the most part, scouting majors is not going to be your priority in a scout. Next up, you've got your scout minors, and this is going to obviously affect your ability to accurately scout all minor leagues. So for a scout here, it's more important to have this than the major leagues, but for the most part, the upper minors, you're going to have a good idea of who those players are. Scouts are rarely going to be wrong on them. For the lower minors, though, that's where it becomes a little bit more important. You'll still generally be accurate on them, but especially for some of the very young players who have a lot of room to grow, a long ways to go until they reach the major leagues, you'll see a little bit more uh, disagreement on the quality of those players. So having a scout who's really good at scouting the minors can help you pick out some players to target in the younger minors as trade options. Now the next category is, in my opinion, the most important, Scout International, especially with the new international amateur system this year. This is going to affect your scout's ability to scout uh, international amateurs to produce quality scouting, or excuse me, yes, uh, scouting discoveries, international players that your scout essentially creates out of nothing from the international landscape, and your scout's ability to scout international leagues. So, for example, if you have the MPB on, then your scout's ability to scout that league is going to be affected by the scout international Although I believe it's also tied to scout majors, and if they have minor leagues, scout minors. Anyways, the scout international is going to be critical in identifying international amateurs to side, especially with this year's system, which allows you to be a lot more dynamic with your approach to it, uh, and in general, produce higher quality international amateurs. And obviously, producing high quality scouting discoveries is a very good bonus as well. So in general, this is going to be the most important category since it will significantly affect your ability to produce quality prospects, especially on that superstar spectrum. And final is Scout Amateurs, which I think is the second most important to Scout International. This is going to be your ability to scout players in the draft for the most part, but also some players who are young and unsigned in some cases, uh, though generally it's more like it's it's almost exclusively for the draft there are very few things it's used for other than that and this is going the accuracy i should say as well of international players is going to be much lower this is the toughest place to scout which is partially why the international scouting is so important because if you do not have a good international scout and you're not putting money into your budget for scouting you're not going to have a very accurate view of international prospects, international amateurs most of the time. And with the amateurs, it's a similar situation. It's a little bit easier to scout draft prospects, especially college players, but it's, it's still very difficult. And you only get so many draft picks a year. If you burn, say, a second round pick, that could have been a quality prospect. But obviously, it's important to make sure that you're getting the best players possible out of the draft routinely. So Scout Amateurs is very important to make sure that you're getting good value there. Anyways, now that we've covered these four things, which are probably the most important thing on a Scout, the next thing that we need to cover is the Amateur Preference. And this is going to be, uh, as I've said before, with the Majors and the Upper Minors, for the most part, your Scouts are going to be pretty much in agreement. Most Scouts are going to be very accurate, even if they're not good Scouts on the Majors and Minors or upper minors rather, but when it comes to younger players, 
the lower minors, the uh, international players, almost every international player at that, and your draft prospects, there's going to be disagreement among scouts on how best to evaluate those players. So from your spectrum, you have the highly favorability scouts, the favorability scouts, the neutral scouts, the favor tool scouts, and the highly favor tool scouts. So on the highly favor tools side, your scouts are going to directly evaluate a player's ratings. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's pull up a player as an example. So Nico Horner has these ratings according to OSA. Now, if you go into the editor, these are Nico Horner's true ratings. This is going to determine how he's actually going to perform in the engine. So when a game is played, this is what is used to determine the outcomes of his at-bats. Now, your scout, if, you're ha if you have a highly favored tool scout, is going to just evaluate your player based on these ratings that are going to directly translate to results in OOTP. So what they're going to do is they're going to essentially just be giving you numbers on a pl player's profile that are basically modified versions. And I'm also going to turn off relative ratings so it's a little bit clearer to see these kinds of things. But they're going to just be translating the editor ratings directly to the profile page. And the only thing that is going to cause any kind of inaccuracy is them. So there will be some given inaccuracy, but for the most part, they're just going to translate the editor ratings, which determine how a player actually performs, to the profile page. So very straightforward system, um, very simple, easy to understand for the most part. And they're essentially what a highly favored tool scout is going to do is tell you how a player is going to perform. This is Nico Horner's actual capabilities. This is what is going to translate to performance in OOTP. And then it's up to you to understand what those ratings mean and how they're going to affect outcomes. But anyways, that's besides the point. Next up, we've got our highly favorability scouts on the other side of the spectrum. So highly favorability scouts are going to evaluate or attempt to evaluate rather for amateurs what they believe their peak will be. So essentially, rather than just telling you this is what a player's editor potential is. So this is my best guess of their editor potential. The highly favorability scouts are going to attempt to evaluate that editor potential. And then they're also going to make their own determination on how a player will reach that potential. So how much of that potential they actually expect a player to develop to. They'll do this based on statistics. They will do this based on age. They'll throw in a whole bunch of other complex uh, things into their evaluation of players. So generally what that means is the ratings that are displayed by a highly favorability scout are not actually the player's true ratings, but rather a more probable outcome of where they will develop to than a player's actual potential. So when you're learning OTP for the first time, highly favorability scouts might be a little bit easier to understand because they will tell you a a better approximation of where a player's potential is actually going to end up than a highly favored tool scout who's going to tell you what their actual potential is. Anyways, um, there are three other types of scouts, the favor tools, favorability, and neutral scouts, and they're just a little bit of a blend of both of those. So obviously with the higher favorability, you have the most mixing in of, um, of non-editor factors to what a, a parent rating is. So you're going to have more statistics factored in, and the age is going to be factored in more heavily, etc. And the more you or the closer you are to the highly favored tools, the more the editor rating is going to be used. So favor tools is going to be mostly editor rating, a little bit of statistics, age, etc. mixed in. Neutral is going to be a touch more statistics, age, etc. mixed in. Even as far as neutral, it's mostly the editor rating, and by and large, you're going to be okay. And then you got favorability, which is much closer to the ability or the highly favorability side of things a much greater degree of statistics, age, etc. mixed into the scout's evaluation of a player. Now, there's a couple of other things that factor into how scouting goes. Uh, the number one thing is going to be your scouting page, and this is your budget. So you have a just overall budget. This is the whole amount of money you're spending. 
on your scouting. And these numbers are actually what matters. It's the percentage that you are allocating of your scouting budget to each portion of the scouting. And then the amount of money that you're investing total in each area of scouting. So the Cubs here are spending a little over $10 million in their scouting with 12% of it into the majors, 24% to the minors, 29% to amateurs, and 35% to international. And this is a fairly normal split in terms of how scouting budget will be allocated. So they're ultimately spending about $1.25 million in the majors, $2.5 million in the minors, $3 million on amateurs, and $3.65 million on the international players. So what does this monetary investment actually mean for your scouting? Well, your scouting director has their accuracy, which is how close they're going to get to uh, actual evaluating a player's ratings. And the amount of money is how frequently your or how many players your scout is going to evaluate at a time. How frequently each player gets evaluated by your scout. So more money, your scout evaluates players more frequently. Uh, you're going to catch ratings changes more quickly, and your scout is going to be more accurate in their evaluations because they're getting more looks at a player essentially. So those factors or the, the speed of scouting is influenced by those numbers. Uh, and of course, with the international budget, this also will slightly influence the quality of scouting discoveries you get. But for the most part, it's just how fast your scout evaluates players. And there's one other thing to factor in here, which is your global settings scouting accuracy. This is essentially just a modifier on the accuracies you see under the scouts the four ratings here. So if you have very low scouting accuracy, then let's say average becomes fair or even lower, or an outstanding becomes a good in terms of how a scout's um, accuracy will actually play. And with that said, uh, that's just a general overview of how scouting works. So the next thing I'm going to do is take control of two teams, the Chicago Cubs, who have a highly favored tool scout with good across the board, and the Cincinnati Reds, who have a highly favored ability scout with good in most categories, but excellent for scouting amateurs. And we're going to take a look at the draft pool through the eyes of both of these scouts to see essentially what the difference is in their evaluation. And then I'm going to uh, give a little bit more insight into how favor tools versus favorability actually factors into your club's ability to produce prospects. And I'm going to give general recommendations for how I run scouting and how I would suggest you also run your scouting. Anyways, we're going to go ahead and go to our office and take control of the Chicago Cubs here. All right, and now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the MLB draft pool and see what prospects look like through the eyes of a highly favored tools scout. So first, I'm just going to make sure, OK, we're looking through our head scouts eyes here. So you can see that there are a lot of high quality prospects here. We've got a number of five star prospects, a number of four and a half, four star, three and a half star, basically a full draft full of prospects that our scout believes are. And this is just batters, mind you, that are going to or likely to be high quality players down the line, the types of guys who could be MLB all-stars or so. But anyways, um, let's just quickly sort by some potential just to get an idea of where the top end tools are going to be in this draft through the eyes of a tool scout. So we've got here a number of 75 power guys, a lot of 70 powers, uh, 65 power, a lot of those, 60 power, a huge number of that. But anyways, just take note of how much power our highly favored tool scout believes is in this draft by evaluating purely the potential rating of these players. Now the next thing we're going to do is quit our job, and then we're going to go ahead and take over the Cincinnati Reds. So I need to quit my job here. And now we're going to take a look at the draft pool through the eyes of the highly favorability scout, who does have slightly better in, or amateur scouting than the highly favored tool scout that the Cubs had, but ultimately is going to 
be very similar overall in the accuracy. Now notice how much fewer high potential players there are according to the highly favorability scout. This is all players. Now there were a ton of three and a half star or better, probably round and a half to two full rounds at least through the eyes of our highly favored tool scout. But the highly favorability scout thinks that there's only 15 or so guys who are uh, three and a half star or better and thinks that the overall potential of this draft is going to be much lower, which is about what you would expect from a highly favor uh, ability scout. Anyways, let's go ahead and take a look at the batting potential and just compare the number of power, high power potential players. And you'll notice that there are a couple of 80 powers according to the ability scout. That's just going to be general scouting kinks from player, or scout to scout rather. That our ability scout believes there are, but there's a lot fewer 70 plus power guys. There's a lot fewer 65 plus power guys. And uh, the 60 power guys, obviously, they're still considered to be a lot, but the page it ends here. This is probably about where we would see the end of the 65 power under a highly favored tool scout. So this used to be a much more extreme thing. Uh, this year, even highly favorability scouts still are largely going to translate your editor potential. And they're going to do a pretty good job, generally speaking, of identifying which player, or they're going to do a better job, I should say, not necessarily a pretty good job, of identifying which players are less likely to achieve their potential. But anyways, as you can see, the highly favorability scout is a lot more pessimistic about the quality of this draft class than the highly favored tool scout. So what does that actually mean in terms of your scout's ability to identify players? Well, if you've got a highly favored tool scout, you're going to bet on acquiring a lot of higher potential players that are going to go completely unnoticed by the ability side of the things. Teams with highly favorability scouts are going to miss, say, 75% of the high quality prospects that the tool scouts will pick up on. Then, respectively, their teams can pick up on them. And maybe even in like the fifth or sixth round, you can get very high potential players. But the thing about those players is they're going to bust at a high rate. So while you will develop a good prospect pool overall for your minor league system you're going to develop superstars and some of those guys will turn into lesser players overall the ability scouts are going to hit at a higher rate so the players that you're going to see taken by ability scout let's say you have like a an 80 percent bust rate with a highly favored tool scout with a highly favored ability scout that might go down to around 70 percent it's not going to be super dramatic it's not going to revolutionize your accuracy at identifying prospects who are going to develop. But it will help some in weeding out guys who are a lot less likely to develop. So if you're not a big fan of 18-year-olds who are just massive potential but very little development, I mean, those guys will hit every now and then, but you can't rely on it regularly. So if you're not into those guys, the highly favorability scouts might be a little bit more useful to you. But in general, uh, just the raw quantity of high potential prospects you can get with highly favored tool scouts will outweigh the ability to get prospects who hit at a slightly higher rate with ability scouts. And now for my general scouting recommendation. I believe that it is always correct to run a highly favored tool scout. And the biggest reason for this, excuse me, I did not mean to go to the draft pool. I meant to go to the available personnel pool so we can take a look at these scouts again, is that highly favored tool scouts are going to tell you the actual editor rating of a player. It should be, or I believe it is more useful to assess yourself when a player's editor ratings are not necessarily going to add up to success or to a, a higher probability of a player developing to their full ratings rather than having your scout tell you. That takes away the opportunity for you to identify some of those 18-year-olds who are higher potential and also to identify certain prospects who are maybe higher potential and higher probability of reaching it, that ability to scouts just miss because that's how they're built. So in general, highly favored tool scouts just give you a more accurate, more complete viewpoint of players and when you've learned the game a little bit uh, that you can provide the ability scouts insight yourself without sacrificing the ability to know what a player's true editor ratings are so yeah in general uh, 
ability scouts are not going to be as useful as tool scouts, especially for experienced players. But even for newer players, I would recommend just taking the time to learn the system because in the long run, it will be more useful to have tool scouts. If you're running an ability scout, you're not going to learn the system because they're going to deceive you with what a player's actual ratings are. Now, my second recommendation is to run a minimum scouting budget unless you are a huge budget team. And the biggest reason for that is because you do not need to have a high scouting budget with a good scout, a good, I should specify, highly favor tool scout in order to accurately assess players. You can get away with about 5% major league scouting minimum budget and still get accurate reads on major leaguers. You can do 20% in the minors. My general recommendation for splits, I'm just going to quickly pull it up here so that you can see what I like to do, is something like 7, 20, 30, and 43 or so uh, on a minimum budget. This gives you the best opportunity to get accurate scouting on your amateurs and international players, and especially to get quality scouting discoveries. And uh, in general, if you're running a higher budget, which again is absolutely a good idea if you have a large budget team, then I would pump this number down even more. So for example, you could run a budget three times this high, no problem, because the maximum is 27 million. In that case, I would decrease the major league scouting to two or three. I would decrease the minor league scouting to 10 or so. I would decrease your amateur scouting to about 25 and then just pump the rest in international scouting. Get absolutely accurate reads on your international players and get the highest quality scouting discoveries you possibly can. Anyways, that just about covers everything for scouting. Let me know if you have any questions on scouting directors, how scouting works, etc. And I will be happy to help you out. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.